Carolyn, it's lovely to speak with you again, but a shame that this time we can't do it in person, unfortunately. Being in Auckland, I'm still in lockdown, and I really wish I could be there in Wellington today to speak to you in person. Thanks, Lindsay. It would be nice to see you all again. Um, we're really missing seeing all of our members, actually, to be fair, and, and feeling for all of you still in Auckland trying to work in lockdown and trying to reach deadlines like the Triple CFA deadline, etc., when you know, you're still working remotely. So, yeah, it's, it's really, really tough, and, and you're certainly doing the hard yards for the rest of the country, that's for sure. Lots of challenges at a very busy time at the moment, and I know we'll be touching on some of those during the course of today's podcast. So just to rewind for a moment, um, I recall the last time we spoke during our previous podcast that we spoke about some of the amendments to the Credit Contracts and Consumer Finance Act, which I believe were originally due to come into force in October this year. Um, That original implementation date now seems to have been um, pushed back, and I believe that that's been moved to December. So I wanted to open today's conversation by asking you to talk us through how that extension has come about. Through work that we did, obviously, on behalf of our members, the FSF, but also in conjunction with the New Zealand Bankers Association. So when we went into lockdown, we were already in a situation where people were having difficulty meeting the deadline of 1 October with or without the the fact of trying to work remotely or or whatever. Um, And it just seemed to us to be reasonable that if Auckland particularly, because that's where most of the head offices of most of the financial institutions are, um, if they were going to be in lockdown for any great length of time, that making meeting the deadline of 1 October was going to be even more problematic. And it still is problematic to an extent. Um, I think members are reporting to us now that they feel a lot more like they're going to be ready by 1 December in terms of the project work and the and the um, the work on changing of systems and that sort of thing. I think that it's given them a little bit of time to actually take a bit of a, a bit of a breath and actually test some of their systems um, rather than just um, putting them out there and hoping that it'll work. They're actually having some time to sit back and test, which is which is something that they're very very grateful for. But they are still having issues, obviously, with things like staff training. Mm-hmm. So. You know, you can do an enormous amount via Zoom these days. As you know, this is what we're doing right here, right now. But it's still not quite the same as actually being in the room and testing people's understanding through their body language, through their sig- the signals that they give you as to whether or not they're, they're looking completely perplexed by the whole thing or whether or not they're actually getting understanding, getting an understanding of it. So, yeah, we... Um, you know that is it is uh, um, unfortunately just the way it is and you know we're not the only industry that has issues with not being able to to get together with people face to face and with not being able to travel around branches throughout the country and all that sort of thing but you know they're, they're making a really good fist of it and the extra two months has been a real godsend as far as that's concerned. I can imagine, and I can imagine that at the time the implementation date was pushed back that nobody actually imagined that we would still be in lockdown on the 1st of December, although that's seeming increasingly likely, unfortunately. I'm afraid so. Now, you mentioned training there, um, Lynn, and I'm really interested to hear from you about how the Financial Service Federation may have been able to help in that space around kind of training and just generally helping to prepare people for these changes. Yeah, thanks, Lindsay. Look, we realise that the the changes are significant, particularly with respect to the changes around assessing the suitability of the loan and assessing the the affordability of the loan. And we've we've covered off what those changes look Mm -hmm. like in the previous podcast. Um, But how could we help our members to get across the line and to to get their, their people prepared for that? And also because of the changes that are quite significant for senior managers and directors of of, um, lending companies. So we were already looking at ways in which we could support members through more education qualifications um, that relate specifically to what we do, which is responsible lending. And so we had a consultant already that we were had doing some work for us, looking into things like having an actual level five national certificate um, in responsible lending on the New Zealand Qualifications Authority framework. Um, So we were sort of moving down the track and then we just went, actually, 
no, let's stop that. That would be a nice to have, but what would be absolutely essential would be to provide some training for the frontline staff and something mm -hmm. for senior managers and directors. So we were lucky that we'd started that work with the consultant that, um, who's worked in the, in the financial services education space. And she was able to um, recommend to us that we partnered with Strategi Group, who are a training provider. And we've had a really, really good um, experience with working with them. So effectively what they have developed for us with input from our members has been two modules, one for the frontline staff that deals with the suitability and affordability piece, and one mm -hmm. for senior managers and directors. And that senior manager and directors one covers off their personal liability and the due diligence that they have to have to do to be, to ensure that their business is, is fully compliant and not in breach of any part of the triple CFA to cover off their personal liability, which is huge. Mm -hmm. um, and Strategy I have therefore produced two modules, um, the frontline one, uh, they both include a guidance note, uh, a webinar that has been interactive so people can ask questions throughout the webinar presentation. We've offered those live um, webinars to the staff of our member organisations three times for each of them, the senior managers and the frontline one. Um, and we've had over a thousand staff from our member organisations go through them so far. We will offer them one more one more time, seeing the deadline has been pushed out because we actually had them scheduled to go before the 1st of October. So we'll offer it live one more time, but also through Strategize website, then um, people can access recordings. So they can access the guidance note, they can access a recording of the webinar and frequently ask questions that came up during the recording of the webinar. So um, we've been able to offer that free of charge to our members. Uh, there is a small charge for non-members people from non-member organisations, um, and that's had some reasonably good uptake as well. But it's one way that we can try to help make sure that our members, the staff of our members are prepared, but also um, it takes some of the pressure off them, particularly during lockdown. And it sounds like that training is going to be very gratefully received by the industry. It sounds like you've been able to really take advantage of that kind of delay in the implementation really do some beneficial things for your members so yeah. with the delay and the training that you've been able to put in place to help to prepare the industry how well prepared generally do you think people are now for the upcoming changes I'm I'm hearing that members feel a lot more a lot more confident about their preparedness this time um, than they would have been had they had to try and meet that one October deadline with or without a lockdown um, so I think yeah that they it's been coming. They've known it was coming. The, you know, the, the hold up was waiting to see exactly what the changes were um, until everything was finally um, finalised. But once they've once they've got it, they've just run with it. They've had to. They uh, they knew they had to. They've used the um, compliance checklist and and oh, sorry com compliance plan and checklist that we had developed mm -hmm. for them by Chapman Trip, um, and they found that a really helpful um, resource for going through exactly what all the changes are and assessing their, their readiness for meeting those changes. So, yeah, um, I think I think FSF members feel reasonably confident. That's really great to hear. And I guess just to sort of close down this um, kind of part of the conversation, Lynn, I wondered if you could just sort of summarise um, now what those key steps for the industry really are when preparing for those changes. So just kind of set out what, what exactly the tasks are that people should be looking at right now in preparation, if they haven't done so already. They haven't already. If they haven't <laughs> already, they're in trouble, I would suggest. But um, I guess the key things that they should be concerned about are um, have they got all of their? Are they fully compliant with the uh, with the whole process around assessing the suitability and the affordability as per the regulations? And also, um, what are they doing with respect to their record keeping um, to to um, be able to demonstrate that they did those assessments according to the regulations, and that the answers that came out still led them to the conclusion that this was responsible lending? Um, there will be um, a need to consider the way in which credit is advertised. Um, that is also, there has also been some changes around that as part of the, the new regulations. Um, and so I guess, you know, the key things are, are your staff fully aware of what the changes are and the impact that that will have on the conversations that they have with, with their customers? 
And I think the other thing too is what we've of, what has often not been considered in all this is the changes as they will affect consumers, because whilst we're immersed in it and we know that from one December things are going to change in terms of the way people access credit, that's not necessarily something that consumers are aware of. And I think there's a growing awareness of it. I think that some of the banks are already talking about the fact that they're tightening up their credit criteria already. Um, and so people need to be aware of the fact that access to credit isn't going to be the same as it, as it has been in the past. Um, but we are also working with the Bankers Association, or we have worked with them, to develop a consumer resource to explain the changes, why they're happening, what they mean for consumers, what to do if you find that access to credit is a lot harder than it used to be in terms of um, talking to a financial mentor. So we've also partnered with um, FinCap, the National Network for Financial Mentors, and we're uh, going to be launching that, unfortunately not in person, at an event, which would have been nice, mm -hmm. um, but um, we will be launching it virtually at midway through this month. And that will go up on members' websites. It'll be available for them to print out and hand to customers if they actually ever get to see them in person again. Um, it will also be available via the banks. It'll be available via the um, financial capability network mentors. Um, so hopefully that will give people some context around why all of a sudden, particularly if they had an existing relationship with a the lender, um, they go back to them to, to borrow, uh, to replace a vehicle, for example, um, and are suddenly being asked questions about their discretionary spending and how they, how they spend their income that they've never been asked before. Absolutely. And I'm really glad you raised that because it certainly seems to me as a kind of um, external observer here to the industry that whilst there's been a lot of chat about it within the industry, um, consumers just really don't seem to be very across the changes that are actually coming and what it's going to mean. I think they're going to be largely unprepared for it, Lindsay. And I think that, um, you know, it will come as a shock to people. And I think, you know, in some ways, I think they'll find some of the questioning to be quite intrusive. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, we have to make sure that they understand that this is, we're doing this because we're required to, not because all of a sudden we really, really, really need to know how, many, how much you spend on takeaways each week. Of course, because they're not going to have that background context necessarily mm -hmm. as to why they're being asked these questions. And it, all they're going to observe is that that process has changed from what they're used to. So, um, yeah, I think it will cause a degree of kind of shock and surprise to some, some consumers out there. So I just wanted to talk for a moment, kind of completely change direction and ask you about the impact of COVID on the industry. So obviously, currently, there are various different alert level settings across the country, and it certainly looks like that's going to continue for the foreseeable future. I just wanted to ask you how much of a challenge those kind of mixed alert levels have been for your members who are likely to have, you know, staff and also customers across the country. And they're having to obviously prepare for any number of different variables at the moment. A really good question. It's a really mm. big question. I think it's a question not just for our members, but for, for business mm. more widely as well, particularly when it comes to things like vaccine mandates. Um, you know, all of those sorts of things. So you'll see that the, the government's issued some health orders that say that um, education staff, health staff, um, MIQ and border workers must all be mandated by certain, uh, uh, must all be vaccinated by a certain date. Um, and then you'll see that there are other businesses that have come out and said that um, voluntarily they um Without a health order, they are going to actually require yeah. that, that mandate yeah. for their for their businesses. I think that's going to become more and more common. Um, and I think the, the issues are, are for all businesses around the employment issues that will come out of that for people who are vaccine hesitant or, you know, um, just completely anti-vax. Um, you know, those, those people could potentially be in a situation where they could have to go through the whole employment termination process. Mm -hmm. um, so there's huge implications as far as that's concerned. Implications around whether or not um, businesses would want to actually do business with customers who have not been uh, vaccinated or mm -hmm. suppliers, because that will also obviously um, impact the business and, you know, how do, how do they enforce that? Um, and then, so those are the sort of really wide issues that, that all businesses, but including financial services, are trying to grapple with at the moment. Um, but I guess specifically in terms of what, what um, impact has this latest lockdown had on uh, the financial services sector, 
certainly it's clear that those areas that are in lockdown are doing less business. Um, mm. Although, to be fair, it's not the significant drop off a cliff um, that it was last time. And I guess that's also because there are other regions that are still um, doing business. And, mm -hmm. you know, so it's not as marked a, a, a decline in, in business volumes as it was last time. Um, there are certainly increases we're hearing from our credit reporting agency members that their data is showing that there are more instances of hardship. Um, but again, it's not the massive spike that you would expect when people have been locked out of their business for 10 weeks and counting. Um, so, you know, some of it seems sort of counterintuitive that um, arrears still are being reported from our members as being quite low. Um, and, you know, in businesses where they're not in lockdown, um, businesses still at, at pre-COVID levels in, in lots of cases. But I think, um, and I think too, that um, at, the, at the point of the, this particular um, session, you know, we're looking at in a week's time, potentially Auckland having this level 3.2 setting where retail can operate and that sort of thing. That will have an impact, I think, on, um, you know, people will be back out in the shops buying appliances, mm -hmm. you know, going to vehicle dealers and buying a new vehicle and all that. Because sort of, we still can't travel either, of course. So, you know, then that people will still be looking to spend money. And, of course, we're, you know, we're getting to that point where we're leading up to Christmas. And I know, you know, the retail sector is desperately hoping for a really good Christmas. Yeah, and I know after last year's lockdown, I think we saw a, an uptick in kind of consumer spending after that ended. So I guess yeah, hopefully for those in the retail industry, we see that tying in with Christmas quite nicely and they have a bumper Christmas this year. Thank you, Lynn. Um, I feel like it's impossible at the moment to have a conversation without talking COVID. So just wanted to hear your thoughts um, around that right now. Kind of going back to our sort of original topic, but I, I guess this could also cover some of the COVID COVID related issues. A lot of your members are obviously high level executives and directors, and they're going to be charged with reviewing their compliance policies at the moment. Now, initially, when I was going to ask this question, I very much had in mind the triple CFA and what do you think the biggest area of concern and focus for them will be? But I guess now with the sort of COVID related issues, there may be other sort of compliance issues and policies that they're wanting to consider there. So what do you think are going to be their biggest concerns right now? Well, obviously, um, the personal liability that attaches to senior managers mm. and directors means that that triple CFA will be very much front of mind at the moment. But yeah, again, not being able to avoid the elephant in the room. Um, you know, there's the health and safety issues around COVID as well in terms of, you know, allowing unvaccinated people into the workforce or into the workplace. Um, you know, directors of, of, um, of businesses have um, personal liability under the Health and Safety in the Workplace Act as well. Um, so, you know, there are there are a number of things that are going on for those those senior managers and directors at the moment that that um, would be, you know, real cause for concern for them in terms of their personal liability. But just, um, yeah, just. Keeping people safe, I think, is probably going to be one of the things that's probably top of mind. Absolutely. And it seems there's a lot for them to focus on at what was going to be a busy time for them anyway. Yeah, now. So, yeah, yeah exactly. I'm sure they're sort of busier than ever. So do you have any particular concerns about the new regulations? And I'm thinking especially in terms of the increased burden that that must be placing on members of the finance industry at present. I think we've had concerns all the way through that the, the, a lot of the um, very prescriptive changes were probably not even necessary. Um, you know, it has always been against the law for um, lenders to, to uh, lend money that is not able to be, that the customer is not able to afford to repay. Um, we, we have always said that we supported the idea that um, the high cost lenders, short term high cost lenders should be more regulated. Um, and the law should be enforced against them. Um, and we've always said that the issue was not necessarily with the lack of regulation um, for the rest of the lending community. It was much more with enforcement. So we're going to wait to see what the enforcement of this looks like um, and, and hope that, that it does do what it's designed to do, which is to protect those consumers who are in a more vulnerable situation from the predatory lending that we know has gone on mm -hmm. and has been allowed to go on because of a lack of enforcement. 
Um, but I think, you know, it is it is what it is. So we we basically have to have to get on with it. Um, but yeah, the concern I think is the time it's going to take um, to get to a credit decision, um, the information, uh, you know, and how prepared are consumers to provide that information, um, the record keeping that's going to be required to demonstrate to the regulator that the, the process is being gone through to the extent that it's required to. Um, and, and I definitely do think that um, it will turn off the tap as far as access to credit is concerned. There will be people for whom um, previously the decision was made that, um, that um, they, the, their fixed commitments were such that they could afford the loan um, and that they would the decision was made that their, their discretionary spending would be adjusted accordingly in order to accommodate the loan repayment. We can't make that assumption anymore. Mm. Um, and if the consumer themselves can't demonstrate adequately to the, the lender that they can adjust their discretionary spending to accommodate a loan repayment, the answer will have to be no. Um, so there will be a lot more no's. Um, and a lot less yeses, and that's that's a concern. I think that's a concern, not just um, because people won't be able to um, access credit when they want it, but it's a concern for the economy as a whole. Um, and that is, you know, something at a time like this, um, and you know, post-apocalyptic COVID times, um, that that really is that the right thing to be doing. Yeah, it certainly seems like a very big concern given the kind of current nature of what's happening. We're going to have a lot of small business owners who in particular are struggling, you know, to even keep their businesses afloat right now. Um, the kind of continued impact of the lockdowns on people that perhaps might not have regular employment and rely on, you know, other kinds of work to, to fill that gap. You know, credit plays a big part of those people's, you know, just ability to manage day-to-day -day expenses. So I imagine that's, that's going to have to be a subject that's probably going to need to be given more thought and consideration in the coming months unfortunately yeah we'll have to we'll have to wait and see I guess what effect it does have but yeah looking into the into the future that would be my view that it, it would certainly it must have an impact on the access to credit so mm -hmm. So I know we touched on this next subject um, in our original podcast, but I think it's something that's particularly interesting, and that is how New Zealand's regulations compare to overseas reg regulations, and in particular, Australia. I know we spoke last time about how they've taken a very different approach. I'm just really interested to hear your, your kind of thoughts about what those two different approaches are and, and how that kind of works when we're often used to working very closely together as two countries. Sure. Um, you know, we've looked to Australia in the past and thought that our, our lending laws were, were quite um, light handed compared to theirs. Um, and we've considered ourselves to be quite lucky in lots of ways that, that um, we didn't have the same kind of imposition of, of um, really prescriptive regulation that, that they do over there. Um, and now it's, it's, it's switched that um, we're the ones that are going to, towards the more prescriptive legislation. Mm -hmm. Australia's looking at loose, loosening theirs. And the reason behind that, um, looking at loosening their, their regulations, is, is effectively that exactly that, the effect of COVID on the economy and freeing up access to credit to ensure that people um, continue to support the economy and support growth in the economy, support local business, um, you know, to avoid businesses having to, to um, go into liquidation and all of that sort of thing. And it just, it does seem somewhat counterintuitive that um, we've just continued because we were already on the journey pre-COVID um, to this tightening up of credit law, uh, we've just continued on it. Um, and we've just carried on towards the, the end, day, day one on 1 December. Um, and, and yet Australia has actually sat back and we, we're going to consider doing something completely different. We would certainly obviously support that idea if New Zealand government ever wanted to emulate the Australians. Um, that's not something that we've said often, uh, but we certainly do in this case. 
it's a very interesting situation at the minute and leads me very nicely on to my last question for today, Lynn. And I, I think I have a few suspicions as to what your answer to this question might be. But if you could make any change to these new regulations, um, which, you know, uh, unfortunately, it appears they are definitely coming in in their current form. But if if you could kind of wave a magic wand and make a change to them, what would it be? I'd unwind them. I'd unwind the really, particularly the really prescriptive regulations around the serviceability um, assessment, the affordability. I just think that, um, you know, people do spend to their income. Um, it's, it, you know, it's a well, the more you earn, the more you spend. Um, and so, you know, you'll have your fixed commitments, like you rent, your mortgage, your insurances, your power and phone and food and all of that sort of thing. And when you start to get into asking people about why they're taking money out of the ATM, what they, they spend that money on, mm -hmm. and whether that's something they could stop, um, you know, and then ha having gone through all of that discretionary spending in a really, really granular way, then also then applying a surplus or a buffer across the top just in case there's an overestimation of expense of um, income and an underestimation of expenses just seems to be going far too far. And, you know, as I say, people take on debt commitments and they by and large meet their debt commitments and, and they do that because they want to purchase an asset or they need the money for something and they will make sure that they meet their repayments. And, you know, we've always said that the vast majority of lending that is done in New Zealand is done responsibly. Mm -hmm. um, it's the it's the stuff that's not being done responsibly that is the real issue. And there are certainly stories, and you know we have a close relationship with the financial capability networks, um, and we hear the stories from them. We hear the stories from consumer advocates of people who have been given debt that they cannot manage. And we just the question for me is always why, how, how did this happen? Mm -hmm. You know where was the regulator? in determining that this was not affordable and not responsible. Um, and, you know, without the enforcement piece, it doesn't matter how much regulation you put in place, unless it's enforced and people are actually put out of business who are regularly providing irresponsible lending, nothing will change. I think that's a really interesting point and one that we've seen with other areas of compliance as well, that it's one thing having the regulations in force, but that enforcement piece is the most important piece of all, you know, regulations without enforcement are worth very little. Um, so okay. it certainly seems like there's going to be a lot more for us to talk about in the future. I think once the regulations are in place and have had some time to sort of bed in, it's going to be really interesting to catch up and kind of see what the early impact of those regulations have been. So I think there'll be a lot more for us to talk about next year. Hopefully at that stage, we're not still talking about COVID, Lynn, and hopefully we'll be meeting in person to catch up on things. Nice um, to in think the new so, year. Lindsay. Yeah, it would be good to think so. Uh, you know, who knows? The, 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 nobody really knows how long this is going to go on for. There's different variants of, of, of the of COVID popping up all the time. You know, it's going to get down to vaccination boosters and all sorts of things um, before we ever get back to any kind of normal, whatever that looks like. Absolutely. I think a, a lot of us feel like we've almost forgotten what normal is at this stage. So, yeah. <laughs> Very interesting times and really interesting as always, Lynn, to hear your thoughts today on what's happening in the industry. I just want to say a big thank you for joining me again. And it's been a pleasure as always to chat to you. My pleasure too. Thanks, Lindsay. Always good to talk to you.